Hiya, buckaroos. That was Tarzan, and this is Ken Maynard saying hello from the tack room of the Diamond Cave. Well, I've been digging around for a story to tell you today. That's why you're here, I know. And I think I've come up with a yarn you're going to enjoy. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> I've been hearing from a lot of parents, too, lately. Seems I've been saving them a lot of work, relieving them in the storytelling department. Well, I'm glad to help out. Now, here's my ranch hand, Charlie, to help out with a word or two for you. Well, thanks, Ken. And from the tack room of Ken Maynard's Diamond K Ranch, we're bringing you stories of adventure, stories of circus life, fascinating transcribed tales of the Old West, where cowboys still follow the cattle trails, stories of rodeos and parades, colorful legends of the Red Man, hidden gold, lost mines, and buried treasure. The exciting tales from the Diamond K are told by Hollywood's champion of Western stars, internationally famous Ken Maynard. Now, while Ken's getting ready to spin today's Wild West yarn, here's something to think about, buckaroos. And by the way, this is not a yarn. This is based on real fact. Do you know what every cowboy's favorite pastime is? Well, after the chores are done, whether it's watering the horses, pitching hay, rounding up the cattle, or taking care of all the gear, the boys just kind of drift together to chat a bit. And the first thing you know, one of them is telling a story. Cowboys just love a good story, and that's why we think you'll get a big kick out of having a set of real Western stories to hear any time you have your chores done. Now, I'm talking about the exciting record album of Ken Maynard, Wild West Stories. It's a beautiful album, all in color, with two of Ken's favorite stories inside, on two big eight-inch unbreakable records, with pictures of Ken and Tarzan right on the records. And best of all, these records are personalized, Made just for you with a personal message from Ken to you right on the record. When you put the needle down on the record, you'll hear Ken say, Hello there, Jimmy. This is Ken Maynard with a story just for you. Yes, you'll hear Ken call you by name, whatever your name is. And he'll tell you two complete exciting stories. Why, you'll be the talk of your neighborhood, Buckaroos. And you know how you can get this Diamond K record album? Just send your name and address with a dollar to records in care of this radio station. These records are standard 78 RPM speed for the regular kind of record player that everybody's been using for years. And say you'll play your records over and over again. Now, here's Ken. Back in the days of the Pony Express, sometime in the 1850s, one of these mounted expressmen was high-tailing it along through Nevada when his horse threw him and he landed smack on the ground with his scraped nose plumb against the richest piece of silver ore you'd ever want to see. This made the Pony Expressman so happy he forgot to cuss out his horse in his haste to get into Virginia City to get the ore assayed. And that's what started the great Austin, Nevada rush in the Reese River section. Now, it didn't take long for the news to get the lost asses, for three fellows, McLeod, O'Banion, and Bryfogle, heard about it. But they were sort of down on their luck, couldn't scrape a nickel between them. The problem of getting that 400 miles to Nevada was one big hurdle to jump. Even if they did have the price of transportation, the only way in those days to get to Nevada was by stage some 400 miles north to Sacramento, and then about the same distance east. But that's measuring miles about the way a crow flies. That road was likely to tie itself up in knots getting there. Now, there was a reason folks had to go the long way around. East of Los Angeles on the way to Nevada is one of the most awful stretches of territory you could imagine, just one desert after another with mountains thrown in between to discourage those who managed to get across the desert. The worst, Death Valley, they called it, with good cause, was full of the bleached bones of those who tried to take the shortcut. But all this didn't discourage McLeod, O'Banion, and Bryfogle. They had to walk, so they were going to save as many steps as possible. As if things weren't bad enough, they started from Los Angeles in June, with the hottest days of the year ahead of them to spend time on those deserts. They weren't burdened down much, just a blanket apiece for the cold nights, a canteen, and a couple of rifles on which they counted for a nice roasted jackrabbit or something or other. They weren't particular. At the San Fernando Mission, the good potteries tried to talk them out of going on. Those boys had more determination than they had good sense. They managed somehow to get across the Mojave Desert, though no one knows how, and skirted around the Argus Range, making the most of the nights to get around the desert stretches, like the Panamint Valley. Now, Panamint's a nice-sounding name. Those Panamint Mountains almost finished them. And ahead was Death Valley and the Funeral Range, which sounded rather pathetic. They were starting down the east slope of the Panamints when they came across a spring that looked so inviting. They tarried too long and decided to spend the night there. 
The ground was so rough they had to do some searching to find a smooth place to lie down. And since they were getting tired hunting, McLeod and O'Banion decided to bunk together. While Bryfogle had to go off a ways to find a place where a rock wouldn't be sticking in his back all night. Like most people camping out, they didn't take off their clothes, just their shoes. And they were so tired it wasn't long before they were snoring. In the middle of the night, Bryfogle was shocked out of a beautiful dream by the loudest yelling he ever heard. It came from the direction of where O'Banion and McLeod were sleeping. They'd been sent on by a bunch of Indians who finished them off in no time. That's what they got for sleeping so near the spring. Well, Buckaroos, Bryfogle decided not to give those fellows an argument. All he had time to do was to grab his shoes and high table down the mountain in his bare feet, which took a bit of going, even for an armory as tough as Bryfogle. When he got into the desert, Death Valley it was, he hid and rested a while before starting across. The heat was terrific, and the only thing he could find to drink was alkali water. He was too thirsty to care, so he drank this stuff and filled his shoes. They were big ones, too. They held more than a canteen, which you remember he'd left near the spring along with everything else in getting away from those Indians. Well, of course, the alkali water made him deathly sick, but he limped on. He must have been hobbling on a set of blisters. He reached the funeral range, and steering clear of water holes for a good reason, he spent the night behind a heap of rocks he piled up for a little protection. He was on his way again at daybreak, estimating the distance to the top of the hills as about eight miles. He was dog thirsty, still sick from the alkali water, which was worse than none at all, the way it burned his insides and made him all the more thirsty. He must have been halfway up when he saw a beautiful patch of green, a couple of miles out of the way, but it looked so inviting and gave the promise of the spring, so he headed for it. On the way, he happened to pass some grayish rock that caught his eye because of the free gold that was obviously in it but he was too tired and thirsty to care much. Anyway, he did grab a few samples and put them in his bandana, already soaked from mopping his brow. He had only gone a few steps farther when he came across the main vein, really valuable pink ore, so he threw away the samples he already had and took some of the new ones. When he got to the green spot, it turned out to be a mesquite tree full of green beans. That he proceeded to stuff himself with. All this made him go start a loco. He was about finished anyway, and he began stumbling around like a crazy man. Well, folks, you'll have to excuse me for my story for a minute, because I want to sit back and get comfortable and tell you about another favorite subject of mine. Speaking of comfort, you know, if a man doesn't feel comfortable, he just can't do his best at work or play. And just for your information, I feel my best when I'm dressed comfortably. And you know, my favorite outfit, whether I'm working or just loafing around, is my K-shirt and a pair of jeans. And you'd be surprised how many buckaroos are agreeing with me. Kids all across the country are riding in asking me for a K-shirt like mine. I've told you about it before. It's a comfortable cotton shirt made like a T-shirt in the color of desert sand with my own Diamond K brand in bright red on the front and Tarzan and me looking right at you. If you want to join the fellows and girls that are wearing my own private K-shirt, all you got to do is send me your name and address. Tell me what size you wear, a size 2 or 4, 6, 8, 10, or 12, and enclose a $1 bill for the fellow that makes them. Pretty fancy shirt for just a dollar. And you'll get a lot of wear out of your K-shirt, too. Because it's fine quality cotton, and the blazing colors are put on by the special hand screen process. So send a day. Be sure to send your name, your address, and your size to K-Shirt, care of this station, and slip in that $1 bill. Your shirt will be sent postage prepaid from Hollywood. Now let's get back to the story. Well, for days, Bryfogle staggered around the mountains and the desert, in a complete mental fog with no sense of direction. He must have found water somewhere and had sense enough to eat roots, but his mind was absolutely blank. He managed to get across the funeral rains and the arm of Gosa Desert, and it wasn't until he reached Baxter Springs, 250 miles from where he blacked out, that his thinking became clear again. He spent some time resting up, bathing his feet that were now puffed out like balloons, before striking out again for Nevada. He dropped down to Smoky Valley, and it was there that he saw the first human being since his partners had been killed by the Indians. It was a fellow by the name of Wilson. Wilson was tracking down something or other when he came across the strangest tracks he'd ever seen. They were like human feet, but much too big. He followed him on horseback and then caught up with Bryfogle, still barefoot and all but naked and his beard and hair hopelessly matted. He sure was a sight, said Wilson, with the carcass of a big man, but not much hanging on to it. He was carrying his shoes around his neck. And in one were their ore samples wrapped up in a bandana. Wilson took him home with him, and he and his good wife gave him food and plenty of care. Later, when he had recovered some, they found him a job at Austin in the quartz mill, working for Jake Gooding. 
Bry Fogle told Jake about finding his ore, but he didn't need to say another word after showing him the samples. It was almost pure gold, and gold speaks for itself. Gooding was all for starting out for the place at once, but it took another couple of months before he could outfit a train and get the necessary five or six men and the extra mules. When they reached the Panamints, they ran into Indians who beat them off, and they had to return to Austin. Next time, they started in from the west with a party of 12 men. They got through all right, and Bry Fogle led them straight to the Alkali Spring, but he couldn't find the gold. He did find an old mesquite tree, which he swore was the one which had provided him with that meal of beans, his last before he went local. But there was lots of mesquite thereabouts, and after hunting around a while, Bry Fogle became less and less sure. So did the others who had come all that distance with him. They began to curse and to fight among themselves, and got so angry with Bry Fogle, he was afraid they might kill him. Anyway, they packed up and left, and Bry Fogle dropped out of sight too. But buckaroos, that didn't stop the hunting, not by a long sight. George Hurst was one of the most successful miners in the district. He found a piece of Bry Fogle's ore and kept a bunch of miners looking for two winners before he decided to quit. Now, your guess is as good as mine as to what happened. I've been all through that area myself and know almost as much about it as the next fellow. It's my opinion, for what it's worth, that Cloudburst dislodged some of the dirt and covered up that vein of ore, and there's just a chance someday another downpour will wash it clear again. I just hope the tars and I are passing by when that happens. And as a second choice, I hope that some of you buckaroos are on hand. It couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of saddle pals. Oh, well, say, Ken, I just keep wishing when you get to the end of a story that there was more, especially like this one, because I really go for a real Western story. And I'll bet the young buckaroos listening feel a lot like I do. I'll bet they never get enough of hearing good stories. Now, that's why I think if you buckaroos haven't already ordered your Diamond K record album of exciting Ken Maynard stories, you're losing time. You could be enjoying them. You know, this beautiful colored album contains two stories. There are two complete, big, eight-inch, pure vinylite, absolutely unbreakable records of regular 78 RPM standard speed. And don't forget, they're made just for you with a personal message from Ken Maynard, Hollywood's champion of Western stars. Why, just wait till you hear Ken call you by name. He'll say... Hello, Sammy. This is Ken Maynard with a story just for you. Yes, sir. Ken will call you by name no matter what your name is. Right on the record. That's how they're personalized for you. Why, it's the biggest value I know of for just a dollar. Two records in a beautiful album, two complete Wild West stories, pictures of Ken and Tarzan inside and out for just a dollar. So send your name and address and a dollar bill to records in care of this station, and your album will be mailed, postage prepaid, right from Hollywood. Be sure your name is in the letter so Ken can say hello to you. Don't wait any longer to get in on all this fun. Now, here's Ken to tell you about his next exciting story. Well, that's the story of the Bryfogel Mine, one of the most told tales in the West. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I know you'll enjoy wearing those K shirts of mine and playing those personalized records. And if you see anybody wearing that brand of mine, the Diamond K, together with the picture of Tarzan and me, be sure you say howdy, saddle mate. You'll pick yourself up a fine new batch of friends that way, huh, Tarzan? <laughs> Well, it's along about that time, so guess we'll be moseying along until the next time when I tell you a story about the seven cities of Cibola. This is Ken Maynard and Tarzan saying so long. Come along, Tarzan. You've been listening to Tales from the Diamond K, stories of adventure told by Ken Maynard, internationally famous cowboy and Hollywood's champion of Western stars. Tales from the Diamond K was produced and transcribed in Hollywood.